uh, the magic word today is Oslo, more specifically, the girl from Os Oslo sounds very exotic, but it's, it's much more than that. This is the movie show on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. That's George Kaysen, the handsome one. So George has done a lot of research on this, and we're going to find out what's behind this movie on Netflix. A uh, 10 episode series, um, very exciting, draws you in. But more than that, it reflects things that are true, although it's not a true story, I think. Um, and it teaches you things. And maybe it corrects some of your impressions about what was going on, the, the factual environment of this movie. Uh, George, welcome to your show, George. Thank you, Jay. It's your show as well. You're the host and I'm a co-host, but um, we get into some pretty interesting um, movies and series and this is definitely an interesting one and we'll discuss it and get into all the details yeah well okay so let me just um, lay out the premise in 1993 they had the uh, this meeting in oslo norway um and it led to the oslo accords which some people felt was useful other people did not feel was useless uh, useful um between the israelis and the palestinians uh try to make peace and oslo was a good environment for that at this meeting, uh, at least in the hypothetical premise of the movie, um, two diplomats uh, liked each other, uh, a, Norwegian, <laughs> a Norwegian lawyer, um, no, make, I'm sorry, a Norwegian diplomat and an Israeli intelligence officer, and uh, they, uh, she got pregnant. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> they liked each other. I, I liked each really other liked a lot. Each yeah, other. really liked each other. Yeah, <laughs> and she got pregnant. And if you do the math on it, uh, twenty years later, um, there was a child, and the child is the girl from Oslo, who decides, who learns about her father, and who is in Israel now. He's a senior intelligence officer, not far away from, not far away from being prime minister in the in the in the story. And she goes to find him and see him and uh, and meet him because she has. Um, unfortunately, while she's there, she becomes her presence becomes known uh, to ISIS, um, and they find her in the in the desert near. Um, um, in, I guess it's the Sinai Desert, uh, and they and uh, near Hamas, uh, the Gaza city, and they uh, um, they they kidnap her uh, and her couple friends that she's with on an outing in the desert. Um, and um, it, it goes from there. And it is very exciting and it doesn't end quickly and you learn a lot in the process. George, that's just the premise. Why don't you go forward and, and put some detail on that? Well, I'll, I'll segue into the, the people who are playing the roles and I'll make it quick so then I can get into the real nitty gritty. The, uh, there's a former Norwegian diplomat by, she's known as Alex, by played by Anneke van der Lippe, uh, and she's plays the Norwegian uh, diplomat. And then Amos Tamam is the Israeli. He's like an intelligence minister. He's got a high position. Um, and then uh, Reda Adon plays Leila. That's a palace. Was the palace this one of the Palestinian representatives in Oslo in '93? And then Pia, which is the daughter, the biological daughter of of Alex and Amos is, uh, she's played that by Andrea Bertson, who's another Norwegian. Yusuf is a young man um, played by Shadi Mari, a Palestinian. Uh, Daniel Littman plays Nadav, which is one of the hostages, the Israeli hostage. Anders Anderson is Carl, which is the, not the biological father of Pia, but the step, the father, he thinks he's the father of Pia, but he's really not. It was, it was the father, the biological father. He's the, he's the lawyer in Oslo. Yeah, the, the lawyer in Oslo, right. His but, wife, the diplomat, has never clued him in. Not, in. not before this series. He doesn't know that this is not his daughter. And then Rotem Ahuhab, which uh, is, is Ari, Arik's wife. She's an Israeli actress. She plays it really good. Jamil Khoury is Bashir, the chief of Hamas. He's in a wheelchair. Uh, a powerful uh, character, powerful actor. Very, very powerful. And then uh, Abhim Galea is in Norway. He's a he's in jail. He's a he's a ISIS member. Uh, by uh, he plays Abu Sahim. And then the writers. I'll make this quick. 
writers of this series. You're, you're not making it quick at all. You're making it too long. Okay. Okay. Let's let's, let's move along let's, here. Let's, let's get into it. Uh, we we got to get into the story. I think you've made the point, though. Yeah. This is a mixed cast. Yeah. This is a cast just like the movie of Norwegians and Israelis and Arabs. Yes. Uh, and, and there's a lot of Americans involved, too, in the making of the movie. Yes. Um, and that and that's interesting because that is kind of an accurate reflection of of what might have happened, what would happen, what does happen uh, in this kind of international arena. Um, but, let you know, let's let's talk about what we what we learned here. Uh, to me, I, I just want to tell you this. I I learned about ISIS, uh, not that I care to know very much about them. I learned about Hamas. Um, in Gaza and how they control Gaza, and and the I learned about the ongoing um, you know political type uh, attack and counterattack that goes on in in Gaza, which by the way, George is happening right now again As between we... between the, uh, the Hamas people uh, throwing rockets and bombs at the kibbutz settlements in southern Israel, yes. and they're about Israel uh, you know bombing Hamas in uh, in Gaza. Uh, there's footage in here about Gaza that I have never seen before. I don't know how they got that footage. They they walked down the street in Gaza City, and you got a, a view of Gaza City you have never ever seen before. That was quite remarkable. They must have had cooperation. Was um, that definitely Gaza City, or could it have been some places in Israel that uh, that are predominantly uh, you know have. Arabs? It could have been, but it struck me from at least the establishment like shots, they were really talking about Gaza City. Yeah. Um, it taught me about the, the contention between ISIS and Hamas, which we didn't know about. It taught me, it taught me about, about Scott, uh, espionage and spying. Yeah. Um, between everybody, everybody spying and keeping secrets and using information to achieve goals, which I think is is a true statement of the way things work. We 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 see that part of the world as um, you know a kind of a mirror image of what we what we would like to see in the U.S. Notice in the U.S. it may not be so clear and clean as it used to be, um, and 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 then we find out that uh, gee whiz they're all spying on each other uh, and intelligence is all important uh and they're in a state of constant um constant contention including military contention that's why the um the character who is the chief of intelligence of, of israel is is so important we also find out about vulnerabilities vulnerabilities of the israelis of the norwegians of the palestinians of the of the um, Hamas people and the ISIS people, I mean, it's really these characters are developed, yes. and so in the process of watching them develop, you learn things about their you know their style, their personality, their culture that you would not that you did not know. Yeah. Now, as I alluded to, I have been to Israel, and I did go on tours into the West Bank in an Israeli tour company. And we stopped at places in the West Bank, and then we went to the Dead Sea, and then I went to Masada, which I mentioned. So I'm familiar with a lot of this. And I'm, I'm a historian, so I, I, a lot of this is not new to me. I know about Hamas. I know about ISIS. Um, but um, it's really interesting for me, you know, um, bring up the map uh, uh, now. If you will bring up the map of where was his name? Yeah. If just a quick aside, if you look at this map, you'll see that Israel is this tiny little sliver in the middle of, a, of an Islamic sea, right? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles. And Hamas and ISIS, they're focused on this little sliver. And one of the things that I remember, and it was an Azari imam, he said, where the green flag of Islam has flown, no land shall be lost, no betrayal permitted. So there's, there's a focus of the imams of the, of the Muslim religion to get rid of what they consider this cancer, which is Israel. And that's behind all this. I mean, why can't they all sit down like the 2000, 1993 um, accords and sit down and reasonably with each other, come to some kind of a solution. It's because there's so much animosity 
the, the fact that this little sliver in the middle of the Islam in the Muslim sea. So the story begins you know, with in the Sinai when these three young uh, tourists in the Sinai, which was under Egypt, are hide, uh, taken hostage by ISIS, right? And then the storyline from there continues, right? And then in what you were alluding to, the back and forth, the um, you know, intelligence between the three, and, and you see the differences that I saw when I was in Israel between Israel, which is advanced 20, you know, this was 1998, the present era, and the Palestinians that are living you know, centuries before, I mean, it's the, it was the 20th century, you know, and, and they're living like in the 1800s, the, their whole style of living and whatever. And that's what Gaza is and a good part of the West Bank. And then you have ISIS. ISIS has this thing against everyone who's not, I mean, if you remember um, similar people in Afghanistan, they tore down, they, they destroyed the um, boot, the Buddhist, yeah, um, statues. So this is what we're dealing with, and in, in that sense, and and one of the things that was interesting for me, I'm sort of getting on off on two tenths, is the Israelis in their center, you know, the operations center. I was amazed at how they all work together, and how prominent they are, and how on top of things they are, and 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 how calmly they're dealing with the situation in a very respectful way and even arik he's dealing with some big emotional stuff he's dealing with his biological daughter he's dealing with these two other israeli young people that are taken hostage right and yet he's able to maintain on the surface his equilibrium but the, the woman who played the norwegian diplomat you know i mean the actress she was hysterical. She, you would, wouldn't believe that she was a diplomat in 1993. Because her she, daughter was, Pia, her daughter, the one who was kidnapped, she was also hysterical. Yes, the two Norwegians, I was going to say. We didn't know the Norwegians were so hysterical. We thought they were more stone-faced. But the that? husband lawyer, he's stone-faced. Yeah. Uh, he's very flat effect. Um, to go back to uh, the intelligence center, you know, it struck me, too, that that was a very interesting, and I'm sure it's accurate, uh, portrayal of an Israeli intelligence center. Yep. Uh, for one thing, there was no rank. Uh, they all sat around a, a U-shaped table. Yep. And at the open end, uh, there were screens on the wall. Uh, and they had a, a staffer who would uh, you know, look at the screens. And what was on the screens? Uh, multiple drones. They had drones constantly in the air overlooking everything. And this staffer was uh, really smart. She, she looked like a Yemeni to me, a yes, Yemeni exactly, Jew. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but she was really a, a great character because she could make magic out of these screens and these drones, wherever they were, zoom in, find out uh, all kinds of intelligence, real time, on the spot. The other thing uh, that was that struck me about the intelligence center was, uh, you know, there were there were not a lot of them. I, I, my guess is there was seven, maybe or eight a total, mm -hmm. sitting around this U-shaped table without regard to rank. There were no uniforms there at all, mm -hmm. um, and it was in the context of a much larger room, a much larger office, yeah. and and you had this feeling of uh, yes, this is secure. But within that larger office, uh, it, it's transparent. Everybody could see what they were doing. They could overhear what they were doing. These guys were the center of the brain trust. Um, and they were controlling important uh, equipment, important decision making. Yes. And the thought process was very democratized. Exactly. Exactly. And you have to con look at the, uh, you know, Jamil, uh, what was his name? Um, that played this God, I'm, I'm tired today. Jamil, yeah, that played Bashir. You looked at his center, and that was that was very much what I remember on the West Bank and the Palestinian areas. It's it's sort of it's a very different. You have to contrast that, you know, of where um, Bashir had his headquarters, right? And then one thing when you well, saying, Bashir was totally in charge. Yes. Everybody, everybody kissed his ring. Exactly. Uh, then there was no the, the hierarchy was him and everyone else. 
Right. Um, there was no free flow of, uh, of information or even conversation. He right. was in charge. He was a very wary, smart, clever fox kind of guy. Um, but you did not see that democratization at all. No. Um, and uh, you also saw, you know, it's like wheels within wheels within wheels. And their agenda was um, was completely different than the Israelis. Right. Um, and they were really into the the espionage uh, and the secrets and the using information against people and right. and uh, making deals that they knew they would not keep. Exactly. Making over and over that was portrayed in this series. Right. They made deals. They swore on things and never kept a, si a, sim a single promise. Right. Um, and that was so for the uh, the ISIS crowd too. The right. ISIS crowd was uh, really interesting because the ISIS didn't have a headquarters at all. No. They didn't have an intelligence center. No. Uh, they were run by uh, people who were really, really mean, murderously mean, um, and whose whose primary mission uh, was to kill, was yeah. to kill. Uh, and it, it was, of course, uh, they had to do the thing with the uh, the jumpsuits and uh, and the uh, slicing throats and beheading, beheading people and all that stuff. Some people can't watch this. There wasn't that much of it, but some people can cannot watch that that part of the series because it was so bloody and violent and unfair. I mean, these were young kids. They were, you know, early twenties, and they had not a bad bone in their body, and they, they never did anything harmful to anybody. And yet, ISIS was taking advantage. The other thing it taught me about um, ISIS is that. It's thrown together, and um, you can have you know people who volunteered uh, to be in ISIS thinking it was one thing, um, but in fact it wasn't what they thought, and and um, they found out that it was just uh, really uh, a kind of a, a deception, and then when they got into ISIS, the stakes were high. It can't get out again. It's like you know it's like a mob. You get in, but you can't get out. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably true. And that's the way a lot of ISIS people got sucked in and uh, and had to stay in or die. Case in point, Yusuf, that was Layla, the Palestinian negotiator from 1993. Her son got sucked into ISIS and then he realized he was in beyond his above his head and he couldn't do what they wanted to do, you know, killing these young people. So he he sort of turned coat and, and you know, left them. But, um, uh, you know, this was after uh, what was her name? No, Noah, I got to put my glasses on. The young Israeli, yeah, Noah Solomon, when she had her throat slit, that was episode four. I didn't want to watch the rest of this. I mean, I'm, that really bothered me, you know, when they ISIS slit her throat. I know, you called me up and said, I don't want to watch the rest of this. Exactly. Uh, it was just too, 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 too traumatic. But it's okay, because it it, okay. it resolved after that. It was That was the only serious violence, uh, you know, which resulted in... Uh, you know, her death. And when you saw that ISIS guy, that the leader of ISIS raising his hands and taking into uh, religious, he was talking religion, you know, I mean, this is what this is what was driving him. If you I mean, the guy with the glasses, the head, you know, the head of that ISIS unit. He was, so was a perfect he, character, wasn't he? Played the role. I mean, they, if, you, if, you, if you met him on the street, you say this is an intellectual guy. Yeah, he yeah. reads, he thinks he uh, exactly. definitely in charge. But if you look at him in the field, which is, I think, what we have here, you know, the ISIS people are smart people. Well, they were. I don't think there's that many of them left. Uh, smart people. They, they were educated. They could uh, use computer technology and so forth. So this, you know, it's funny how all these these groups come together in this ep in this uh, series and you get to see them engage all of them. And, and they uh, they retain this kind of cultural strategic uh, 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 independence and uh, the engagement is it's the it's a social experiment you know, to see to see how they engage with each other and um, um, you're troubled by it you're troubled by it because you come away feeling that's nice they had the Oslo Accord Accords um, but uh, at the end of the day. Um, there's a lot of violence under the hood. There's a lot of very negative things happening. And what exactly is the solution? And it's not isolated. You've got Iran involved. You have other. And uh, I mean, now, you know, there's the recent accords between Israel and uh, and so, um, a few of those uh, Gulf states, which is a very positive thing. You know, they're finally getting along. Right. Um but it, there's, just, there's just so much, the middle, the whole Middle East is just a, 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 a real mess. You know, I mean, I'm 
part Armenian and the, between the Turks and the Azeris and the Armenians, there's all kinds of things going on over there too. So the whole Middle East, you would like to hope that Israel can continue with these accords with other nations because uh, Iran is behind a lot of this, you know, with Hamas and even Erdo Erdogan is, is playing into Hamas. So you got a lot of intricacy here, but you know, one of the things you alluded to is how they're all playing, you know, against each other. And there's so much under undercurrent, you know, behind the scenes. But I want to also get into the interaction between Alex and Arik. You know, she's really playing him, right? Because he had an illegitimate daughter and she's using him, right? To, to save the, Pia's life. But I mean, she really gets a little out of, I mean, that's, that was out of hand. I mean, she was really, he, here's, he's a minister. I think he was the intelligence minister and she's playing him, right? And then he's up at the top of his um, balcony in his house seeing his wife, you know, and the two, his two kids, right? His two other kids. And he, a little tear comes to his eye because he knows if she, if she divulges the fact that she, she, he had an illegitimate child, and that's one of the reasons he's trying to save her, it would ruin his career and of course ruin their life. And his wife was saying, you know, she knew what was going on. And she says, we're going to have to give up all of this, our, our house, our-, our Well, you've got, you got to look at the way an Israeli family works how the wife protected him. Uh, and I, I guess so you could say she forgave him, but um, she protected him. She protected his career. Exactly. I, I don't know if you'd see that in an American movie quite the same way. No, the this, other thing is, I think the I think the producer director were trying to show us um, that that people don't understand what goes on in the Middle East. They come from, you know, Scandinavia they don't really have a clue. They don't understand about the undercurrent you're talking about. And they, you know, it's like the ugly American, uh, the ugly Norwegian comes in there and busts all the China up, which is what they were portraying Alex as doing. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, that's a very important part of this series, that what you have is um, three countries, essentially, um, and you're watching them connect with each other. It's interesting how the the, uh, the episodes fly from one place to another. One minute you're in Tel Aviv uh, or Jerusalem, the next thing you're in Oslo, the next thing you're in Gaza. It just moves so quickly uh, that you, you know what happened here. What you know what is going on? Well, what's going on is it is that this is an international story, and it's a, in, in fact it's about an international set of places that are connected at the hip, like it or not. Um, and I think that tells us uh, something about today's world. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of diplomatic and international issues there, and a lot of technology there, and a lot of, mm, what do you want to call it, uh, espionage and war strategy there. Um, I, I was fascinated with it because um, I, I really had no idea where it was going, but I knew that I was learning a lot in the process. It keeps you on the edge of your chair to wonder if those other two young people are going to have the same fate as Noah did, Noah Solomon, when she had her throat slit. God, I still, I'm still trying to remember that, so I forget that scene. But, but bottom line is, yeah, there's a lot of intricacy here between, as you alluded to, there's a lot of intricacy between them. And you see the dichotomy between the three elements and how each one operates. And it's just fascinating to, to, to get through those tense. I mean, I, to reiterate, I really had problems with those two Norwegian actresses and the, how they were hysterical. And oh, the Israeli mother who lost her daughter, how stoic she was, how, how, how adult she was compared to those two crazy Norwegians. You know, I have issues with Stoltenberg too, you know, that Noah, the NATO head. But, you know, but as you said, they're in their never, never land up there in the nor Northern Europe. They're away from all these issues. There's, you know, Germany, Nazism, that was decades ago. They don't have any problems, major problems with Sweden, Denmark, England. So they're living in a never, never land. And Israel, the Israelis are dealing with what they're dealing with, with Hamas and ISIS and other people, and even the Christians in Syria, the Yezidis. Um, so this shows you the Middle East, what a mess it is. I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll let you say. Uh, well, I just, I just want to talk about Layla for a minute. Um, Layla was also at the Accords. 
Yeah. Uh, Layla's a Palestinian. Yeah. Uh, she was a, a doctor. Yeah. She worked in a hospital to try, try to save lives. Yeah. It was her son uh, that uh, uh, that that absconded and joined ISIS. That was a, a really interesting twist in the plot, yeah. and uh, it was horrible for her to find that. Um, she didn't want her son uh, subjected to either Hamas or ISIS, and there he was breaking away and going out into the desert to join ISIS. Woo. Um, and, and she cared a lot about people. She, she, was, uh, she was ministering to some child that had uh, some kind of uh, cancer, and uh, she wanted to take the child to, uh, this is an interesting part of the plot, to uh, Tel Aviv uh, to get uh, cancer, cancer therapy. Uh, the chemotherapy it was, and she was willing to take all kinds of chances to make that happen. And furthermore, um, she was able to persuade the Israelis who uh, were and are monitoring the border very closely yeah. um, to let her pass with the ambulance and the child. And so you realize that, you know, there's humanity there. Uh, her humanity in terms of caring about this patient child of hers and the Israelis' humanity in letting her pass through to save the child's life. I, I also found it very interesting uh, that they, they talked about the tunnel. And we, we know about the tunnel from the newspaper. In fact, there were many, many tunnels. And what the movie uh, claimed was that all the tunnels had been destroyed save one. And this was a tunnel that was used for what diplomatic or maybe espionage purposes that you could actually pass from Israel through this tunnel, a long tunnel, um, a well, a well-built tunnel, I might add, um, into into Gaza City. <clears throat> and um, a lot of action takes place in that tunnel because it's the only way that you can get from one to the other. That was really an education. I thought all the tunnels were either closed or, well, not functioning. This one was was left open intentionally by the Israelis for, they stated the reason, and I think it was something about diplomacy or maybe, you know, some kind of emergency um, need to pass, pass across that border. Uh, anyway, Layla, Layla was a huge character in this, yes. and she was uh, responsible, caring, um, she was uh, educated, uh, she was um, sort of a victim uh, of Hamas and uh, ISIS, and she was trying to do the right thing at all points. And if you, if you want to look at a character who was kind of the mirror image of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the intelligence officer, it would be Layla. Yeah. Because she she did not she her agenda was appropriate her her um, intellectual and emotional reactions to thing were things were civilized uh, and uh, I think they intended that I mean it didn't happen by accident in the movie um, this was this was a, cr a critical character for them yeah. and, and and as I alluded earlier a lot of those all those Palestinian Arabs were Israeli Arabs <laughs> and they're given they're obviously given a, a role in this joint Israeli-Norwegian movie. So it shows you that there are Arabs in, in, in Israel that are given work, you know, in, in movies, you know, and they, they played, and Layla played her role very, very well. And she was a positive character. So they showed a, a, a Palestinian Arab as a positive character. So, so taking it up a, a notch, then, it seems to me that there are a fair number of Israeli movies coming out. You know, I mean, not to say that there aren't a fair number of movies coming out from all over the world now. Uh, one side effect of ISIS is is that people watch more movies like you and me. Um, and many people, not only in this country, but around the world are watching more movies and the movies are more international. I mean, uh, I don't know if I told you I watched a Bulgarian movie, which I thought was excellent. Um, every country you can think of, you know, South American countries, uh, African countries. Uh, I watched one uh, two weeks in Lagos in Nigeria. It was a pretty good movie. So, I mean, everybody's getting in on the act. And that's really important because this is, what do you want to call it? Movie diplomacy. If the Israelis have to work with the Arabs, have to work with the Norwegians to make this movie and the Americans who were involved to make this movie, then what we're really doing is we have a collaborative effort among various nations to produce a ostensibly profitable project uh, and share whatever message they want to share 
with the whole world was all sitting around watching their movies. So while we have all this contention, while, while we have you know, the problems of COVID and, and, uh, and autocratic governments hither and yon, um, the movies are connecting the world right now. This one is definitely a connector. Yep. And, and definitely the way it was produced was a connector without a, without a doubt. And it brings you into the idea that people can work together if they choose to, instead of fighting against each other and killing each other. There was yeah. sadness here. I mean, as I said, bothered the heck out of me, episode four, but- Well, it was sadness, but ultimately, uh, I, I don't want to reveal anything to people who haven't watched the movie, but ultimately worked out. Yeah. Um, and a Norwegian girl was saved. The, the girl from Oslo was saved. Uh, it was a close call, but she was saved. But the other young woman had her throat slit. And it she was lost. Uh, she, she was, was, she was a, a fatality, a casualty. Oh. And, the, and the young man was, uh, um, the young Israeli, he, was, he, he became friendly with, um, you know, with the girl from Oslo. I don't know where, where it goes from they there. They were friendly before. That's yeah. why they went to the Sinai together. Yeah, well, maybe maybe it's more than that in the, in the sequel. <laughs> yeah, well, they, 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 they were obviously falling in love, too. I mean, you could tell that that was going on. I mean, there, there was a love relationship there. But, I mean, the one thing is that Pia went to Israel, because her, her parents up in Norway didn't know, to, because she found out that Eric was her biological father. That's why she went there in the first place. And then she met these two that might have, where she met them and had become friends. They were very close friends with, with Nadav and, 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 and Noah. You mean the, the two Solomon kids, you know? So there's this a little, you know, one of the things you've always said, there's little pieces that are given to you early that until the end, you don't understand. And this movie did the same thing. Maybe that's you, why you like this movie so much, Jay, because they didn't tell you everything up front. They right. But a piecemeal, little pieces until it all comes together at the end. So. Right. Breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs they are. And you follow the trail of breadcrumbs. You have to, you have to watch carefully so you can pick up on them later. Yes. Um, and of course, um, you know, as we have discussed, um, these characters were, uh, they, they were resonant characters. You, you could be from anywhere in the world and appreciate their motivations. Uh, yes, they came from different cultures. And yes, some of those cultures are not cultures you want to spend time in. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you could understand what was going on. So you could be from um, Varanasi, India, and understand this movie. And so that's, a, that's another point of my, my international look at it is that this, this is built, as many, many of these international movies are built, to be understood around the world. Uh, it's not limited. It's not limited to anything. It's, a, it's, a, it's opening up um, a discussion, a conversation that is viable anywhere in the world. All good. All good. Well, thank you, George. A very interesting discussion about a very interesting series. There's a lot more out there. I'm not sure they all rise to the level of the girl from Oslo because that was special, but we're gonna we're gonna do them one by one. It would, it may take a thousand years, so uh, you know, stay safe. Thank you, thank you for all your insights today, Jay. Sorry, I got into too much of the nitty gritty, but I wanted to give a record recording for each of the actors and actresses and give them credit. You know, <laughs> thank you again for all your insights. And we'll do the next. Thank you, George. Thank you, Jay. I look forward to our next show big time. Same to me. Have a good day. Take care. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.